and it tells me it is recording. Very good. So for everybody's information, we are recording this. This is the second of three, you know, 203, Executive Order 203 Public Forums. Anybody unfamiliar, the governor passed an executive order asking any municipality that has a law enforcement agency to do a thorough review and to make recommendations regarding reinvention or reform of current law enforcement policies, practices, et cetera, and left it fairly broad. So the city has been engaged in three ways to do this. Number one, there is the EO203 Collaborative, which we've been working with uh, most closely with the village of Homer. And SUNY Cortland has been lending some advice. The county was involved early on. Um, we are working with a mediator and with representation from several local groups. And that is continuing and ongoing. We also have a public survey that Chief um, saw the email, so we, we think the survey might be out. It went out in the mail today. Outstanding. So there's a perfect uh, public survey that is targeted to a uh, portion of the population, hopefully to get a representative sample of the population. And the third way that we are soliciting for input to give the public the opportunity to weigh in is these are through these public forums. And again, this is the second of three. We want people to share their thoughts on what is desired from the City of Cortland Police Service. And um, people have the opportunity for three minutes longer if we don't have many speakers, and we might be to that point. Um, people who are not able to make it to these forums, and they say this because I know that we have people who may be watching from home, or they may watch this or read about it. Uh, they are more than welcome to submit in writing, and via email it can be to mayor at portland.org if you've got comments. And you can also submit via regular U.S. Postal Service. The address is 3543 Cortland, New York, 13045. And the goal is to hear from city residents and non-residents who are stakeholders about what is desired from the City of Cortland Police Department. Uh, we've put together, and I believe it is on the webpage, there's two documents on the city webpage. One outlines a lot of what the police department currently does and how we're structured, and the other gives four different categories or areas that we are investigating or discussing as we look at fulfilling the governor's executive order. So guidelines for today, we ask the people, please, when you are speaking, have your camera on at the start. If you are asking to be a speaker, state your name and the street where you are a resident of. And if you can speak directly to the functioning of law enforcement in the city of Cortland, we're talking specifically about what our local department does and law enforcement and what our city department does. So the goal, we're giving opportunity for policy, procedure, and potential the vision. What is it that you would like to see if you do not already do that? Comments about specific instances or people's experiences should reflect what we want to see about law enforcement. If there are complaints about individuals or instances, those should be reported directly to the police chief. Uh, this is about visioning. This is not a, com a public complaint form. So having laid out the ground rules, the floor is open. Is there anybody present today that would like to speak during the public forum number two on executive order 203. And we did have somebody who requested she is not currently online. And if everybody is here just to observe and listen, that is fine as well. Well, we might end up with a little bit of dead air. If you are here and you would like to speak, you can give me your name and address in the chat box, or you can visibly raise your hand, or virtually raise your hand if you're familiar with Zoom. Chief, 
Joanne Wickman. Oh, shoot. I can hear you. There you go. That's good. Um, you got I, it. I have to move from where I am down to the kitchen, so I'm going to shut this thing down for a couple of minutes. I don't have anything in particular to say, so I just wanted you to know why I'm going to disappear. I don't think I can walk down the stairs and keep this open and not drop it. So that's where I'm going. But I'll be well, keep it open and it tumbles over and over. I'll check and make sure you're all right. <laughs> you could call the police, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I will mute, though. anybody else joining us if there is anybody present that would like to speak the floor can be yours broken what we are reviewing into four main categories. First one being what functions should police perform? Number two, discussion on staffing levels, budget, and equipment. Three, police standards and strategies. And then four, leadership, culture, and accountability. And this is, there's several items if you are not familiar with it. They are on the city's webpage. And under each of the four categories, there are several items or specific subjects that are listed. By no means is this all inclusive, but it does give people a good idea about what we are uh, discussing and investigating with the EO203 Collaborative. Whitney Hargett, am I pronouncing your name correctly? Yes, can you hear me? Can hear you, and uh, Whitney, the floor is yours. Okay, so I'm Whitney Hargett. I live on um, 160 Grun Ave, uh, apartment one in Cortland. Whew. Okay, so um, that's the best way is to be direct. Uh, I would like, the city of Portland police to improve the way they handle domestic violence calls. But before I fully uh, commit to that statement, I'm basing it on, um, I was an advocate at the YWCA um, violence from 2013 to uh, 2015. Um, so that was, you know, roughly six, seven years ago. So I want to make sure I have the most updated information. So I was wondering if <clears throat> I could get a brief description of how, uh, an officer would go about a domestic violence call now in 2020 in the city of Portland. So and, and, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, just so that I know, because, you know, it was a while ago that I was an advocate. So um, maybe things have changed. And if so, then that statement is irrelevant. Um, so I would like to know what is the ideal way that a Cortland, <clears throat> a city Cortland police officer would handle a domestic violence, domestic violence call? I don't know who to exactly uh, direct that to. Maybe the, the, the chief, if he could 
Well, that's a, that's a pretty broad question, and we would handle a domestic violence call like every police officer in the state and in the nation would handle it. You go to the call, you assess what's going on, you try to identify a primary aggressor, and if necessary, you institute the uh, mandated pro-arrest policy. The idea is to diffuse the situation to make sure that uh, each party um, is safe, uh, depending on who is determined to be the primary aggressor. And we do have a pro-arrest policy. That's it in a nutshell, that probably every police officer in the state um, handles a domestic call. Okay, and how often would you say, would you say that a dual arrest was made? That would be a complete guess, that I don't know. A lot of, okay. it, depends, a lot of it depends on what the violation is. If it's truly a violation, it has to be initiated by one of the parties because police officers can't make a violation arrest that doesn't happen in their presence. If it's a crime, such as an assault, then we have a pro-arrest policy. Okay. So let's say um, two of the individuals involved, there was assault on both sides. The, the police officer tries to determine who the primary aggressor was. If they can't determine that, then they can make dual arrests. Okay. Okay. So my problem was, is that on more than one occasion, um, from different clients at different points in time, I was told when the police were called, um, the police said they would have to make a dual arrest because they could not identify the primary aggressor. And <clears throat> In those cases, it was obvious who the primary aggressor was based on the injuries that the victim obtained. And uh, uh, any, the injuries that the perpetrator obtained uh, not only looked like defense wounds, but were extremely minimal compared to the victim's injuries. Um, so I don't know, has there been a, you know, I've sort of dropped it six or seven years ago. Um, and then, uh, you know, it's been playing in my mind, dropped thinking about it anyway, because I was an advocate supposed to help them. And they came to me with advice and with this concern and uh, justifiably so. So now that I get a, uh, a chance to actually talk to the chief and talk to other police officers about it, um, I wanted to sort of, you know, like, Maybe I just need more information or uh, uh, have there been problems in the past with too many dual arrests in the, the city of Cortland Police Department? No, not to my knowledge. We handle several domestic incidents a month. It's one of our highest priority or one of our hard, highest calls and highest priority. I don't doubt it's, doubt it's one of the highest calls and uh, because when I worked there it was around 80% of our cases were domestic violence cases um, and then I'm sure COVID really escalates that. Uh, I'm guessing, I mean, I guess I will stand with my statement. I mean, uh, I'm glad to hear you say the primary physical aggressor because so many times we came up, uh, up against that wall of, well, for instance, an officer would say, well, it's not my job to, to identify who did it because there's both people have injuries. And um, so I'll have to arrest you and then you can go in front of a judge. And that's the judge's job is, is to 
is to determine who actually was the aggressor, which, um, which is false. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I guess I would like to I stand by. Um, how often do the police officers get trainings on domestic violence cases? That's that's a pretty broad statement. I don't know what you mean by training. What what type of training are you specifying? Education, education on uh, uh, on how to handle this domestic violence, why domestic violence occurs, um, statistics on, uh, um, yeah. I guess does that help at all? <laughs> No, not really. I don't know where you're going with it. Uh, well, I mean, I, I think the question is pretty direct. How often do they get domestic violence training? And do do the police officers work fairly close to, because I've been out, out of the loop, uh, do you guys have any reach out and do you work at all with the aid to victims of violence? Um, yes. yes, we do. Okay, and in, in what ways? Advocate referrals. Referrals. Okay. Okay. Any any trainings or, or you know, um, yeah, any trainings that the ABV uh, um, and and your officers have together or. Um, I don't know of any trainings that ABV has ever sponsored. Well, yeah, I mean, when I was there for two years, I, I, I know it was touched upon maybe getting together with the local police and, and having an actual class with them and learning about domestic violence in the same class as police officers. But I don't think anything that um, I guess I'm done. I would like uh, um, it to continue then to be a, it sounds like it's a priority it, at your department um, to find the primary physical aggressor in domestic violence situations. So I'd like that to continue um, wholeheartedly um, because I know in the past it's not happened for a couple of individuals I work with. Sorry, I'm Paul Sandy, I'm the deputy chief. I'm sorry to hear of those situations and they would have been prime situations to bring to our command, to our administration. If, if there's a situation, particularly something as grave as you're talking about where there's serious physical injury and the domestic violence and potentially the, the likelihood of future violence you know, if we weren't able to sort it out correctly, those are the things that we need to hear about so we can give a second look at these things. Um, I do know that <clears throat> we have attended joint trainings with Department of Social Service on different things, particularly Child Protective Service, uh, which is another highly volatile situation and often involve domestic violence situations, and we work on those together. Um, our officers work close, closely with one another, so if there's a situation, even if it was a young officer who was having difficulty at a scene, there are always senior officers they reach out to and, and try to um, come to a good conclusion on, on who the primary aggressor is. But um, there are those calls where, you know, I can't cite any off the top of my head, but I do know there are a few that, that we've had where, you know, violence on one part got violence on the other part, and although this person started was the initial aggressor but the second party did you know maybe with a knife you know wasn't justified under the law either and it just kind of snowballed before anybody got there uh, which is sometimes you know we try to get there as expediently as possible but a lot depends on where our officers are how fast we get the call how fast sometimes we get these calls after it's over and and the violence is, is done um, but we try to get there and separate them as the first thing is to separate them to cease any activity and, 
and stop any violence and, and try to sort it out. Some, some cases are clear cut, other cases they aren't. And that's where we need people that if they have more history than we have um, to be able to bring that into the situation. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Um, I'm hesitant to give details, but basically there was a, a choke print marks around the victim's neck and um, there was no knife involved, but there were scratch marks on the perpetrator's forearms. So that, I mean, for me, that was pretty obvious for me that, um, first of all, the severity of it, she was choked hard enough that there were bruised finger marks around her neck. And it would make sense to me that she would try to claw him off her if she was being choked. Um, and then there was another one where her finger was broken. And again, there were scratches physically that appeared on the perpetrator's body. Um, but broken finger is a little bit more severe than uh, defensive scratches. Um, <clears throat> and the, that uh, victim happened to be four or five months pregnant. Um, so those are the two that come to mind. Um, but thank you. So in the future, I mean, not that I work there anymore, but in the future, we would come to your office, make a, a write up a complaint. How would that process work? Chief, do you want to answer that? Or do you want me to? Uh, on a personnel complaint? Yes. Yeah, you, you could stop down to this police station and, and uh, file a complaint that way, or there are uh, complaint forms online on our website, on the City of Portland website. When you go to the Police Department's page, they're, they're online right there, too. And they could be emailed or delivered uh, by mail or in person, any way that you can get the information to us. We can take it. Oh. Okay, thank you very much. And I apologize. Um, I'm in my car because my two and a half year old will not leave me alone. I would not be able to talk to you guys. So I'm in my car doing this. That's all I have. Thank you. I mean, no apologies necessary. Any parent understands and anybody that's not been a parent wouldn't understand. So there's no need to apologize. But we okay. do appreciate you coming out and speaking and it gives us uh, the opportunity to talk about and maybe make some adjustments if need be in terms of how we interact. And uh, also thank you for your work with ABV. I understand how challenging and difficult it is and how important it is as well. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Have fun with the two and a half year old. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. He's, <laughs> he's something. <laughs> Very good. Uh, looking to see if we have any other speakers that would like to have privilege of the floor. Again, I will repeat this periodically, and since we're about a half hour into it, now is probably a good time because we have had, I believe, a couple people join us. This is the Executive Order 203 Public Forum for the City of Cortland, and what we are doing is giving people the opportunity to speak, and the goal here is to give us an idea of what we envision for the City of Cortland Police Department. Uh, in addition to myself, I did not introduce myself. I'm Brian Tobin, Mayor for the City. Police Chief uh, Catalano is on, Deputy Chief Sandy is on as well, and Troy Beckwith, who represents the seventh ward in the City of Cortland, has joined us. Uh, there is, be, this is being recorded, and I believe it might be being live streamed because there is media present. And we do have a request from Patricia Shad. Patricia, hello. Hi, thank you. Um, I was hoping to share before Whitney got off. It's my understanding in that CIT training, AVV does come to that and has a whole section for the officers. And so they do hear that information in that training. I wanted to start by talking about the leadership with city. So I'm here as Mobile Crisis, Liberty Resources Mobile Crisis Team for Cortland County. And I just wanted, I guess, um, really put out there the leadership with the city police department is so invaluable for what we have in our community. 
uh, they're very collaborative and really seem to value mental health in with everyone, youth, adults, everyone. Um, my experience has also been very, they've been very responsive. And so that's very much appreciated when we're talking about some pretty complex um, individuals and cases. What I would like to see, just uh, thought, so the uh, collaboration with Mobile Crisis currently is excellent. Um, I think it's probably one of the closest in many of the surrounding counties. Angela Adams, I see, is on here for Mobile Crisis, so she wants to add anything to, to this. But I think it would be really nice to see um, a stronger collaboration between the two and having those social workers be part of many of the calls uh, that could involve mental health, not just suicidal ideation or um, something that's very clearly mental health based. And so I'm not sure, you know, what, what that could look like if it would be through a 911 system or, um, you know, how we could expand that. But I think that that would be very helpful. And I think it would give more time to the officers that are maybe going out on these repeat callers um, to kind of pass that on to mobile crisis and let them handle those situations so they can go to other ones. Do you, uh, Patty, do you have any idea of how to collaborate uh, more with social workers and, and, and which type of social workers are you thinking of? So in my mind, and again, this is with my mobile crisis hat because I have other positions in the county. So just to be clear, um, in my mind, it would be through the 911 call system. So if there was a clear mental health call coming through that could go right to their licensed clinicians that are on the mobile crisis team, and it could go right to them to go on those calls. So your officers didn't have to frontline them and then call in mobile crisis. And mobile crisis could call your officers if it was a safety risk, you know, if there was concerns and they were needed. Okay. All right. I'll, I'll uh, get together with Lieutenant Guerrero and we'll discuss if there's a way that we can find that to happen. Um, yeah. Yeah. Good idea. So, just so I understand, the recommendation would be instead of if there's some potential mental health issue instead of police being the first responsive responder a mental health professional would be pending the the situation safety yes very good i'm taking notes Any further comments, Patricia? Patricia or Patty, what do you prefer? Patty, thank you. Very good. No, I appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for being here. The purpose of this is to give people the opportunity for feedback and this is the second of three. And we're looking to hear thoughts from city residents and stakeholders, uh, people who are engaged in the city about what we can and should be doing right here in the city of Cortland to continue to stay on the cutting edge in terms of law enforcement and uh, providing the services that our residents desire. slower pace than our first one, but we want to make sure that we're giving ample opportunity for people to give their feedback. Thank you. 
Ryan, just curiosity, since we got a little low here, um, are you getting, have you heard any feedback from any other municipalities that are hosting events like this that, you know, how the turnout's been or the interactive with everything? I just was curious if, it, if anybody's tracking that. I, I did see that the county has a presentation plan for tomorrow night with a uh, opportunity a window at the end for feedback questions I believe uh, I'm not certain if the village is doing anything although we've had some conversations and the other two law enforcement agencies in the county are the state police which are covered by the state and then the university police up to the college which essentially are also covered by the state so in terms of the county, not too familiar with, um, there was a call two weeks ago arranged by the New York Conference of Mayors. Uh, there was a number of speakers from across the state and not sure that everybody is going this route in terms of public forums, but the opportunity for public feedback has been um, the opportunity for public feedback has been stressed by the governor's office and by the governor himself. So like I said, we've got a couple of different ways that we are looking to give people the opportunity to share their thoughts. Good. Chief, have you heard back from any other municipalities or anything? Uh, a lot of, well, I should say a lot of some municipalities held these forums earlier. Uh, like in September, uh, depending on the size of your jurisdiction, that depends on how much participation you get. Smaller agencies like us, I, I don't think we get a ton of participation, but the, the bigger, the larger agencies with you know hundreds of officers, they can pack up an evening easy with comments. And a lot of it is people um, not understanding all that a certain, their police department does, and it's more educational than it is anything else. Anybody present that would like to have the opportunity to speak, share some thoughts, all you need to do is give me your name in the chat, or you can turn on your camera and give us a wave, or raise your hand virtually as you wave, raising your hand on the screen. It's nice to see John and Mavis safely downstairs. And we do have a question. Deputy Chief may have prompted a question. Joanne Wickman, you have the floor. She's muted. Oh, Joanne, you need to turn your microphone on first. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, sorry. I'm trying to make dinner at the same time I'm listening, but I did have a thought and I wanted to ask this partially because I spent a lot of my retirement years thinking about publicity. Um, I know about some of the things that go on with the police department, but I actually missed the first forum because I didn't realize it was on. And I'm wondering, and that's prompted this question really, I'm wondering what ways the police department locally uses to publicize what is being done and what programs are being, have been implemented. I know myself because of the work I have done of several, but I'm not sure everybody in the city knows that, knows what I know. 
So that's my question. How is information spread? Now I am going to do it myself. Well, we, we have our own Facebook page, um, and I have personnel that work on that because I, I'm not a Facebook user. Um, so we try to get out as much as we can on, on our Facebook page and then our community oriented policing officer, Jesse Abbott, he has a Facebook page of, for his own program. And other than that, we just try to use the regular local media outlets like the uh, Cortland Voice, Cortland Standard, WXHC, um, when, we, when we want information to get out. If there's other... I guess the, I guess the comment I would make, there's, there's so many other ways people receive information these days, um, in addition to Facebook, which is basically used typically, typically by a black demographic. And I'm just wondering, and I don't know how feasible this is, I don't know who could possibly do it, especially in a year in which there's no extra money around, um, who could really help with finding other means of communicating besides the traditional, the radio, the newspapers, even the online newspapers. I mean, they, I, I'm not, and I'm not the one, because I certainly don't know enough about it to, to, to offer my services for sure. But I'm wondering if there if this would be a worthy thing to explore. Because listening to what Patty Shap was saying, I thought, what a, what a great idea. I would no, never have thought of that. She obviously knows about an area I know a little bit about, but not very much. So just listening to people talking is going to prompt some ideas, I think. But I would like to suggest that the city leaders think about ways in which publicity could be shared in other mean, by other means other than radio, uh, newspapers, and so on. And I, and I, as I said, don't have the answers, but I think we, should, we probably need to do more than we're doing. So now I am going to mute myself and go back to fixing dinner, but I'm listening. All right, thanks, Joanne. Sometimes doing the job and discussing how you're doing the job, it's important to make sure we are sharing. Um, there's no one way to get information out to the public and know that everybody is going to get it. This is a good opportunity for us to hear people's thoughts about what makes sense and what they'd like to see from the city police department. What's the point of this? Because uh, I missed the first. I didn't know anything about. Any, I didn't know this was going on until I read the article about the kid getting a, not getting arrested and getting released on bond. You know, after he basically sort of terrorized the neighborhoods here in the city. Uh, I did. I did. I read that in the Cortland Voice, and then I, I found out this was going on. So, what's the point of all this? So I can give you a. Uh... And we're about 45 minutes into this. So yeah, I, I know. No, 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 this is good. I, uh, but what I'm doing is periodically I'm covering why we're doing this and what's included because people are logging on, logging off, and we want to make sure that people are getting as much of the information uh, as they can. So the governor passed an executive order number 203 way back in, gosh, June or so. Uh, and basically he, was saying that he wants every law enforcement agency, every municipality that oversees a law enforcement agency to talk about whether or not it needs to be reformed or reinvented or any things that should be changed in terms of how law enforcement is being administered in our communities. 
um, basically said, you have to do something. Uh, I'm not going to tell you what to do, but you got to do something. And at the end of the day, your governing body, which in the city of Cortland would be the common council, needs to pass either a resolution or a law saying, here's what we're doing. We're saying we're not doing anything because we think we're doing well. Uh, so we've taken a three-pronged approach in terms of working on this. Since August, uh, Chief, Deputy Chief, and Bruce Heitler, who's on council, and I joined them shortly after, have been part of what we're, we've called EO203, Executive Order 203 Collaborative. Uh, we've been working with the Village of Homer, uh, the Cortland County Sheriff's Department, and the, and the county was engaged for a period of time, and also the SUNY Cortland University Police, uh, more in an advisory capacity, but has been involved as well. And we pulled in a mediator who has been working with us and also with a number of representatives from local community groups. And the governor put forward, I believe it was August or September, uh, basically a guideline, 118 page booklet that gave ideas in terms of how to address this. So we've used that as a template and those meetings are ongoing. Right, how, to, how to address the meeting or how to address reinventing the police? how to address um, different topics. It's, I think, meant to be a genesis of ideas and cover different okay. areas. Today. All right, so what do you think, how do you think you're doing and the police is doing? With, with, I mean, what, what are we here for? I mean, what's the whole discussion about? We, what, I mean, whatever the discussion's about, how do you think you're handling it? And you and the, and the, the PD. So this is an opportunity for the general public to give their thoughts about how things are currently going or things that we would like to see with the future of law enforcement in the city of court. Okay, and, and that, that's kind of vague and yeah. I don't really understand what that means. How do you think law enforcement is going in the city of Portland? Okay. Um, while I'm Answering that, I direct you to the City of Cortland webpage. There's two documents there. One has an overview of the forums and also four different categories of things that we are reviewing. Uh, another document that the chief put forward has basically an informational sheet of what the department does, which is actually very, fairly large and varied. Um, so your question was, how do I think we are doing? No, well, how do you, I mean, I'm trying to be as tactful as possible. I, I know why we're all here. I, I, I know the, the, the nationwide outrage of why we're all here. How do you think we're doing in the city of Cortland with the police department in regards to the, the overall social nonsense that's been that's been circulating over the past several months how do you think we're doing do you think do you think you run a racist pd i know that we have uh great trained professionals from the top through and we do an excellent job in terms of providing safety and security to the general public okay uh, do you run a systematically racist PD or not? It's no. a simple question. Is it a systematically racist PD or not? No, I do not believe that there is systemic okay. racism. Okay, then, then, what, then what's all this about? All right. So this goes back to the governor passed an executive order and for municipalities to continue to receive state funding. This is part of what we need to do. Okay. Uh, Chief and I sat down, I'll let the chief share his thoughts. Um, but when we talked about this, the idea uh, of making sure that we have our finger on the pulse, so to speak, of the general public, because I have my perspective, Brad, you've got your perspective, and there's gonna be, well, if you've got 18,000 people in the city, you're gonna potentially have up to 18,000 perspectives. So it's always good to hear. Well, the, well honestly, the Mayor, this is the first time I've had to discuss this with you or really kind of anybody else since um, I guess I'll um, what June or May whenever George Floyd protest kicked off that I think 
the, the city, not necessarily the PAE, but the city really kind of let, let the PD swing a little bit. You know, like they let, you kind of left them out there. You know, you, you never backed them up. You, you, you never said, hey, whatever's going on in Milwaukee, that, that really doesn't apply to us here. We, we, we try to run a tight ship. We try to run a, a non-racist PD. You never actually confirmed that you do not run a systematically racist government in the city of Portland. We got a bunch of, oh, you know, we need to hear people out, needed this, that, and the other. And you never, and anybody in the, in the, nobody in the city government actually stood up and said, you know what, we, we do not run a racist system here. We do not have a racist city. We do not have racist citizens. And, and that's, that was like one of the most disappointing things I've seen in a while out of the city. Okay, well, I believe that there has been times where I have made the statement, and if I'm not making the statement to the satisfaction of everybody in the public, that's not my, my, my job is not to make that statement to everybody in the public. In terms of the people who I work with, uh, the chief on down, that's got to be the mayor's primary responsibility in terms of uh, leadership with who you're working with. And I think it's important for us to not conflate two separate issues because you're bringing up the protests that came about from the death of George Floyd and others throughout our country. And when we start to talk about um, law enforcement and people that support law enforcement, and we talk about uh, the issues that we are having throughout our country in terms of people of color and how they're treated, it's not a choice. It's not neither or. And I have said repeatedly that we can support law enforcement and we can support people of color. We can support people being treated equally. Okay. And there are, I mean, I'm not, there I'm are not examples. Trying to cut you off. I'm not trying to cut you off, but in that, in that right there is the point. Is, is your, I'm not conflating. What, what, what happens is, is that, that say you in general, you in the, the larger sense, are conflating the two. That Courtland PD is now not Milwaukee PD. And then so whenever whenever I see resolutions, paintings in the middle of the highway or middle of the street, that, that you are conflating. You are conflating Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and Milwaukee PD with Courtland PD and Courtland citizens. And it just is, is frankly irritating that I got, I, I, I received, and you say it's not your job to communicate. Well, I mean, I think really it is your job to communicate. It's not your job to communicate whether or not you have a racist PD or not. And seriously, is that what you're saying? It's not your job. No, no you that, is not, that is not what I am saying. And that is not what I said. Shortly after the event at our first council meeting and after we uh, happened in terms of the protests regarding the death of George, George Floyd. I talked about how we can support people of color and we can support uh, law enforcement. It is not a choice. It's not a dichotomy. And I did not make a choice then and I'm not making a choice now. We can support underrepresented and marginalized members of our community and we can support our professional staff as well. It's not a choice. As, as as long as we don't get into the, uh, and I'll agree with you, as long as we don't get into um, that we need to make, reinvent law enforcement because of actions in one city, and then we need to bring, you know, whatever that reinvention means to Cortland. I mean, you say reinvent. And I kind of tuned in. I wanted to hear exactly what reinvented me. I, means because I, I, I assume that there's already some proposals, not necessarily that the city will take up, but statewide, the state of New York. I'm sure there's something they'll take up to quote reinvent police departments or reinvent um, policing. I've never heard exactly what reinvent means. And if you could enlighten all of us on what exactly reinventing means. 
I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you guys have received something that says this is the kind of things we want. All right. So the governor put forward, and it's available on the state's website. Um, I'd have to track it down, but there is a link. It's available to the public. And it's about 118 pages in terms of a, uh, oh, I actually have a hard copy. Please, so that's, a lot, that's a lot of reading. Right oh, yeah. 118 pages. <laughs> I'm waiting for the book on tape to come out, so I had to read it because the book on tape isn't out yet. But the um, governor's uh, recommendations, basically, and he goes through several different categories in terms of areas that local municipalities can look at. So what we've done is we've taken this to heart and we said, hey, we think that we're doing, uh, we're doing a great job here in the city of Cortland, but there's no harm in doing an evaluation, seeing how we are, and looking for improvement. So if you're not moving forward, you're standing still. And if you're standing still, you might be falling behind. So from my perspective, the purpose of uh, this process, um, I think this will help reaffirm what your priorities on it. And we might hear some things that we've not really known or we've not prioritized, but maybe there's some things that we can do. And maybe there are some things that we can do better. Uh, but at the end of the day, if we are increasing the level of trust in terms of the community and if we are being responsive to the community that is what we do government is here so to how, how do you feel the start happens? and this is how we this is that's what is desired from the public and this is how we try to meet the needs and the strongly desired services from the public okay so how do you, how do you feel your, your starting how, how do you where do you feel the starting point is are you saying you have a starting point where like what are your goals your steps where do you think you've actually made progress or to to whatever progress means what, whatever your vision of progress is you have you have to have a starting point so where do you think the starting point is and where eventually would you like to end up very good so at this point we are uh, compiling information from the public that's the purpose of the three forums last monday today and the third one will be thursday and this is asking for feedback. Can I say something? Uh, Steve, I'm gonna say no at this point. Uh, this is, we're kind of off track because this is supposed to be a listening session. Uh, Brad's asking some direct questions. I have no problem with answering those, um, but I don't want this to get to be off the rails in terms of the goal still being feedback from the general public. So right now we are collecting information and we're doing that through three ways. Uh, I mentioned the collaborative meetings, these public forums. The third one is a community survey that's gone out, which is something that the chief had done, what was it, about six years ago? And we worked with, last time and this time, worked with a faculty member up at SUNY Cortland to develop the instrument and to help make sure that we're reaching um, what will hopefully be a good representative sample from the population. So we're looking for that feedback. After you have the feedback, then we'll sit down and talk about what recommendations go into the draft plan. If we are on track, my hope is that we will have a draft plan late 2020 or early 2021. Uh, that would go back to the public for thoughts and comments. And draft plan eventually would become the final plan, which would go before the eight people on the Common Council and common council then would have the opportunity to either adjust or accept the recommendations and what will be the content of the recommendations is going to be something that has been worked on not just by the electeds but also the leadership and the command staff from police in collaboration with members of the community okay and so and so you think, how do you think, as of right now, how do you think PD is handling itself or, uh, let's get, uh, let's take, let's keep it in this century, uh, or like, since you've been mayor for what, like six years, something like that? You're not, how do you think PD is, but it's handled not. itself in the past six years? Past nine years. We have an outstanding, well-trained professional force and okay. at strong leadership. You've got officers that do their job. Uh, I think it's also important to remember that our officers are people. 
and people need direction. And sometimes I can say that as a person, there's times where I make a mistake and maybe it's at home with one of my kids. Maybe it's other times in my life, but we need to make sure that we are uh, supporting our people the right way. Part of it is the training, part of it is equipment, part of it's vehicles, part of it is the other support that they may need. And part of it might be direction and making sure that we're doing all the things that we can so that everybody can make the best decisions when they need to. Okay, I'll leave it for now. I might tune in to the next one, see what they say. More than welcome to, and please share if you've got friends or others that want to join. Um, I have a hand that has been up and the label is Fire Tablet. I'm going to ask if you would like to speak, whoever has Fire Tablet, if you can turn your camera on and introduce yourself, that would be much appreciated. Hey, Mayor Tobin, it's Vicki Mundy. Um, I don't have the video access up on this. Um, I did have it on my phone, but then I had to use my phone to access the um, Zoom link. So, sorry for the, uh, not the picture. Well, I know you, I recognize your voice, so uh, everybody else approves, I will vouch for Vicki Mundy. Yeah, I was on my phone last time and didn't get a chance to speak. Um, so, and not have video, but I can always save it for Thursday too when I do have video. Well, you're, you're here and you have the floor. What is it that you'd like to discuss? Um, I just want to commend the city police department, the university police and the sheriff's department and the um, mental health training that they have had. Um, prior to them having that mental health training, I observed, you know, several things that were kind of scary and things like that. And I just want to commend them on the mental health training that they've all had, all those departments have had, because there's some other local police departments in the area that haven't had that training. And it's kind of scary. And I just want to commend those departments for having the mental health training that they have. And if they, um, as a community stakeholder, because I do work, work in the city of Portland, um, are, is the sheriff's department still using the yellow stickers for um, safety reasons and medical issues and stuff for children's special needs and things like that? Because um, I've heard of instances where the local police have showed up and not not particularly um <clears throat> in the city of Portland, but as it is the county thing with the yellow stickers that they haven't looked at to see that there's a yellow sticker on the door and they just like knock and go bombard in. So I just have a question on that. So yellow stickers are you talking about at the residence? As you, so there's yellow stickers, I think the sheriff's department can elaborate more on this, that um, help to know that there might be a person that had a um, that um, and you can put on your car too. And that'll tell them that there's a yellow paper somewhere that has what the, the particular individual has, whether it be, you know, that you know, they're autistic, they're depressed, they're, you know, um, diabetic, things like that. So I was just wondering if they're still using those because we've been receiving them through some of the other agencies, but it's not like everybody's on board with using them right now. Or recognizing them that they're on the doors of um, residences or cars. I recall hearing about the program quite a while ago. I can't say that we're up to speed with it now uh, because I don't even know enough about it today. Uh, so I can't answer. I can answer a little bit. I know what she's talking about. I participated in the program when I was taking care of my father and we had a yellow sticker. We had the information pamphlet and had all his needs um, and they tell you to put it in like the freezer or something. 
Um, so it's a place they can look. I don't know today if they are still doing that program. I've been out of the program uh, two years now, so I don't know if they're still doing it. So maybe I might. Uh, maybe one recommendation would be to um, let the county know that if they are still doing the program and make people aware of the program, if they're not doing the program, maybe reevaluate starting the program up and um, give give officers the training of, you know, just don't knock on the door and, you know, start, you know, so they have the training and recognize that, oh, okay, we need to step back a little bit and think about this before we, yeah. Okay. And now I don't know, um, I do have a message here saying that the stickers were on vehicles a while ago, along with what we used to call the whale program for car seats and has not heard about them on houses, only on uh, vehicles. That's and what I'm familiar with. The hospital were in the whale program, which was for car seats. This is a different program. It was, um, it's for more with what um, Paul Sandy was saying, like for if like, there was somebody with medical issues or um, things like that that give you awareness. Like you can find it in the glove box and know what's, what's, what that means or find it in the freezer or in the refrigerator or something and they'll know what it means. So it sounds like it was a way of identifying uh, people who might benefit from a little bit more attention in a difficult situation. Yeah. Yeah. So I was wondering if it was a, a component in with their med um, with their mental health training or um, if not, you know, maybe it could be a component. Yeah, we'll have to look into it. I, I'm not aware that it's a component of it right now. Okay. And, and if it's not, it's not. But um, but that was I know that it was a good program. It'd be nice to um, be on board, everybody be on board, or be like, oh, this isn't, it doesn't exist anymore. Okay. Thank you for giving me the floor, Mayor Tillman. I am headed to my grandson's to um, just um, my son and my grandson and my little guy and I are headed to my grandson's fifth birthday. So we're gonna go enjoy dinner together, just the five of us. And I'm sure you probably heard the little man in the background. Let's go. So, happy, being safe, being happy, happy birthday to your grandson. Happy birthday. Thank you for joining us this evening, Vicki. Thank you for the support. I'm also being told yellow stickers uh, came into the county. There may be a drugstore locally that has a um, life vial bottle and people can put their medications and medical history in it and put it in the fridge with the sticker on the door of the residence. And I'm assuming that the sticker on the door of the residence would be to alert people or responders that they might have a medical emergency. Um, yeah, that sounds like what it was. Um, they were giving them out at like Catholic charities and mental health clinic and things like that. Very good. And the floor is open and I'm going to go back, see no hands up. I do have a request from Whitney. Uh, Whitney, the floor is yours again. Okay, thank you. Um, I actually wanted to um, say that I was interested in the idea of body cameras and I know they cost quite a bit of money, um, but I think uh, they would um, so 
sort of just shine light on or make clear what's happening um, in interactions with the Portland City Police. And um, I'm not so much asking for myself because I um, acknowledge and understand my white privilege, but um, asking for others, uh, I think it might hold not only uh, 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 the police accountable for their actions, but um, um, you know, there's nothing like uh, getting something on camera so you know exactly what's happening at what time. So I just wanted to uh, make that suggestion and also maybe open up the conversation to like, how would we go about getting body cameras? I know that um, Ithaca police have body cameras. Um, so I guess that's how would we go about getting body cameras? Well, I can answer that for you, Whitney. We uh, looked into body cameras a year ago or so. Um, I'm actually favorable on the idea of having body cameras for our department. Uh, we uh, tested a couple of different brands and we came up with policy and um, it would be something I would implement other than the cost factor right now. Uh, there are so many things that the police department needs just for basic functions and to ask for something that's going to uh, cost several thousands of dollars, that's a hard, uh, that's a hard nut to crack with a, a city whose finances are stressed, especially due to COVID. Um, it, it's a good, I think it's a good thing to have. Um, it holds officers accountable and it holds the public accountable as well. And um, it's not a panacea, it's not a cure-all for everything. Because the camera sees one thing and one thing only, it doesn't know what's going on all around it. Um, but that being said, there are definitely benefits. But there's there's a huge cost to it, and there's a personnel, not just an equipment cost, there's a personnel cost to manage all the data that needs to be saved and transferred and secured. Um, so it's definitely a doable thing, but it's a thing that has to be planned for appropriately so that it can be funded without stressing the city. What could we do as um, Portland citizens to help uh, get that ball rolling? Is it a matter of writing letters or, I mean, I don't know how it works. I'm sure we couldn't um, fundraise for you guys, you know, this a certain thing that how could we help you this this is uh, where you started you started on the forum um but it's it's a it's a complete buy-in because it's not just a one-time purchase it's something that has to be funded year after year after year you just don't do it you just don't fund it one time and say we're okay um it has to be built into the uh, budget for many years in the future so would it be like grant writing? There could be grants available, and there may be even more available uh, come next year. But again, the grants will help you buy the equipment, but it doesn't it doesn't help you with the technology storage of, of, the, uh, of the information and the personnel to be able to get that information. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Good question, and that's part of why we're here. We want to hear what the public values, and as we look forward, what are the things that we really want to see? And sometimes it's questions about equipment. What will make sense moving forward? I have a, I have a question for the chief, if you don't mind. If you're looking for somebody to ask something. Brad, I didn't get uh, your last name. Hillman, H-I-L-O-M-A-N. Thank you. All right. Um, this kind of has to do with with body cams because 
um, with discovery laws, and this is kind of for the chief, but you might know this too. Um, has the PD incurred any extra cost, or what what level of extra cost has the PD occurred since uh, discovery laws have gone into effect this year, or have they been able to even, you know, suss that out out of the budget? It it, it hasn't. Um, come with a great cost to us. It was more of a cost to district attorneys uh, because they were under the gun to provide whatever needed to be provided at a, at a, at a time period. We're able to do that. We're able, we're able to get that information to them typically, um, but it was the distribution of it from the district attorney's office that was uh, a bigger expense. So not so much with the police department as it was with the district attorneys. Okay. Yeah, but body cameras probably would add an extra layer of cost. That would be um, a huge discovery as well. Yeah, it would be a huge extra layer because you're talking hours and hours of video footage that needs to be stored and then retrieved at the proper time period. Um, that would that that would play into a big part of. Uh, budgetary issues about what's i'm sure you've gotten estimates of annually how much do you think that would cost for for just video storage i mean i haven't i haven't priced it out uh maybe the deputy chief might have an idea on that i, I typically typically the, the cameras themselves are between 500 and a thousand dollars each uh, but then you need the server that um, holds all that information and and again, that's just the small part of it. The other part is having a, a person, an actual person, available to go through all that information to know what has to be kept and what the time periods are, what's got to be ported where. Uh, so you not only have equipment costs, you have personnel costs. And then I haven't flushed it all out, but um, I, I would say it'd be close to the hundred thousand dollar area per year. Uh, per year. Okay. And I'm, I guess I'm not sure what the, the budget is for the PD. What, what does that add increase? How much or percentage wise? Uh, for our operating expenses, expenses, that would be a huge increase. The majority of the police department's budget goes to personnel costs. Um, and a smaller portion goes to operating expenses. That would be, that would be considered both. You need operating expenses and personnel costs. So that's what, two cars a year, basically? Well, that's basically like two cars a year. Yeah. 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 Right. It's, not a, it's not an expensive proposition. That's So as stated the purpose of these forums, we want to give people the opportunity to share their thoughts, give feedback, and we are looking to take those thoughts and that feedback. And if we are on a timeline uh, more aggressively, we would have a rough draft by the end of the year, but I think it'll be more realistic to expect something uh, to start of 2021. Governor is expecting this to be done a final report by April 1st so that gives us a target date but between these forums the EO203 collab with uh, the Village of Homer and others and the public survey that is going out we know that we have three different ways that we are soliciting for input and looking forward to being able to use those to draft a report that will put out to the public and ask for public feedback come January. So this is one step in the process. And today is the second of three. Our third and final public forum will be this Thursday, 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. So that's December 3rd. And this will also be via Zoom, the same link as this one here, 892-739-1872. 
1872. time, another 40 minutes or so for people if you would like to provide feedback. Mayor, just while we got a break, I've been trying to text the sheriff to see about that yellow sticker program and so far I haven't gotten a response. <clears throat> Seems like an interesting concept. Mm -hmm. Great concept. Give people an idea of officer responding before they get to a residence or if it's a vehicle. Somebody might be getting a little bit of a different approach at times. Hey, Brian, it's Amy. Amy Bugs. Do you, do you want me to talk a little bit about that program? I kind of remember some of it or not. Or you want me to do it on, offline? If, if you've got some information, uh, let me ask first, is there anybody present that would like the floor? Wait, I would, but she can go first. All right, we'll go I to would, Amy. I would go first, yeah. I'll come back to you with me. Amy, if you could introduce okay. yourself, just uh, give everybody a little bit of feedback as to why you know about this, and then, yeah, please, by all means, share some. So, um, I'm, my name is Amy Bugs. I'm a city resident, have been my whole life. Um, I have been a member of Cortland Memorial, Cortland Regional, Guthrie Regional, whatever you want to call it today, um, hospital aid organization for about 20 years. And since I was a member of that organization, the sticker program that Vicki was talking about um, was a takeoff from the nationally recognized WELL program, which was We Have a Little Emergency, Car Seat Safety Sticker Program that originated in Virginia. It was a, you put a little card on the back of the car seat with the, kid, the child's information on it, whether they had medical issues, anything else like that. There was a sticker that was placed on the side of the car, the windshield. We did a lot of advocacy work with the local police departments, um, fire departments in the, in the county. And then <clears throat> that program was replaced with this yellow sticker program that the county sheriff's department implemented, I believe through New York State. Very similar program that um, did the same thing. It was a card that you placed on your on your car seat. It was a sticker that went on the, wind, on the window of the car, the side window, whatever. And first responders of any kind were trained to look for those stickers. Then <laughs> Kenny Drugs came out with the program of the life vial and it was a medicine bottle that had a large piece of paper in it that people in the community, like she said, Capco and a lot of places handed those bottles out and they filled out their health information on it, whatever medications they were taking, they had mental health issues, if they had life-threatening problems, um, you know, autism, whatever. And again, first responders, there was a sticker that went on the front door of the home that first responders were trained to look for and that life vial bottle was put in the refrigerator or freezer whatever with the matching sticker on it those programs i haven't <clears throat> excuse me i haven't um hospital aid i stepped away from that for a year or two and then i just joined back in there a year ago and there's been no talk of any of those programs in the last three years that i know of um, I had, we had done them with, along with the county health department and their car seat safety checks and all that. So they were out there. I think people were familiar with them at one point in time, but I don't think that they're regularly being used. So that's all I know. <laughs> Good. I just wanted to alleviate some of the confusion is all. Much appreciated. I wasn't familiar with it. It's interesting to learn about. Sounds like something that could be beneficial. It was very beneficial, and first responders really liked the concept of it at, you know, at, in, at the in initial onset of it. 
Um, I don't know how it could be implemented within the homes as a national um, or in a countywide program. I think it could be um, with some work with some other outside agencies, you know. A directly related to that, wouldn't it, wouldn't a, wouldn't it be more effective and more efficient if, and, and I'm sure it's done now, that when a 911 calls out or, or responders or when the county sends out somebody that pops up in a, a CAD um, system to say whether or not, you know, the history of calls at this residence, medical or, you know, I mean, because I know there's, you know, I'm sure there's, uh, domestic violence history or violence history or anything like that. I mean, medical history should, if I'm not mistaken, should be included too, right? I mean, because you're basically, you're, you're implementing a sticker program for something that the 911 system should already be doing or possibly do already. Good question. Is that something that is already done? 911 does share certain information um, when a call goes out, um, but they have limited information. Um, they might have repeat call information or whatever given to them. What these vials did and what this data did is it had more in-depth information about the residents and context, you know, specific residents. It's stuff that couldn't go over the CAD. It's just an extra layer. But 911 does give our officers um, certain information that they have access to. All right, then Whitney, did uh, you have some comments? Yes. Um, so unfortunately, I did not make the open forum, the first open forum, but I did watch it. Um, and I know the topic of um, there was some trouble getting people uh, interested in becoming a, a police officer. There wasn't a lot of people taking the test. I think that's what the chief had said uh, last time, that there's only something like 40 people that showed up. Um, and I was wondering if that's connected to another thing that a young woman brought up in the first meeting uh, about um, people not being eligible to become police officers due to very um, misdemeanors, due to small misdemeanors, like uh, stealing a toothbrush, or I don't know. Uh, I forgot her, her example. Um, I just wanted to... Uh, uh, further discuss that is is that a thing is what are the um uh, criteria for becoming a police there's basic there's basic criteria from the uh, with that, with that from the department of civil services basic criteria in order to take the test now every individual agency has their own criteria as far as the background investigation, what they'll allow uh, for a person to become an officer. So there's a lot of variables to take into account, and there's just not a simple answer as to this is going to be okay, this is not going to be okay. We have to look at the totality of everything that's going on in this person's life and how it would affect being a police officer. So there's not a, there's not a simple answer. Answer to that, I mean, there are certain things that are definitely disqualifying. You have to have minimum qualifications in order uh, to be able to take the test and be hired, such as physical ability and mental capability. Uh, those are those are basics. But then beyond that, you have to go into character, uh, moral character, and um, a lot of different areas that you have to look at. So there's, there's one easy answer to any of that. Okay, so if someone did have a misdemeanor, could they still be um, uh, eligible? Or it's yes, it's possible they could be. Uh, you know, it would depend on if it was something that happened when they were juvenile. It depends on what the circumstances of what that misdemeanor was. 
There's just a lot of things that have to be looked at before a decision like that can be made. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. The floor is open if anybody would like to have some comments. Approaching six o'clock, I'll read the overview and the expectations of the forum just to keep everybody up to date with why we are doing this. The purpose of these forums, giving the general public the opportunity to share thoughts regarding what our city of Cortland Police Service does. Uh, ideas to envision why we are doing this and vision for the future. We're looking for city residents and stakeholders to share their thoughts specific to the city of Cortland with the idea of being able to make sure that we are meeting the expectations of the general public. This is the second of three forums. We had the first one last Monday. The third one will be this Thursday from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. And we've had a little bit of dialogue and some back and forth, both at the first one and again this evening. But the main purpose is for this to be a listening session for the opportunity, uh, giving the opportunity for the public to share thoughts so that we can make sure that we are enhancing and uh, doing everything we can to provide the services that people expect in the city of Cortland. We have also been collaborating with a uh, mediator and along with the village of Homer and there's several community group representatives from marginalized and other groups in the community working to hear concerns and come up with potential solutions for some of the concerns that are being expressed. And Chief, the last time it was done was, I believe, six years ago. There is a written survey instrument, a form, if you will, that we're asking people to fill out that has been mailed out. The Chief said it was out today, so it should be coming soon to some of the homes in the city of Cortland. This is that portion has been a collaboration with a professor, a faculty member up at SUNY Cortland, uh, who does statistical analysis and things like this for a living. And our goal is to hopefully get a representative sample of the community and get feedback that way. So there's three main ways between public forums, the EO203 cult collabs, where we are working with the village of Homer and uh, different community groups. And the third one, being the public surveys. And we're looking to make sure that we are efficient in terms of what the community wants to see and that we are providing to the community with regard to law enforcement. So the floor is open. We've got about another 29 minutes for people to share their thoughts or give feedback about the service that is provided in the city of Cortland. I have a question if nobody has a question. Right, the floor is yours. Okay. Um, for you, uh, had since since June, has there been a policy that the PD has changed that that we don't that I, I guess I really don't pay that much attention to PD policy, but is there has there been a policy change of any kind related to the kind of I don't know. I say I'm trying to so related to this issue. Is there have you have, has there any been been any policy changes so far? Um, our most the, our most recent policy change that would uh, be anywhere near this would have been our use of force, but that was uh, prior uh, to all of this. That would have been in 2019, I think. Our our most recent one. Um, that would have anything to do with police reform off the top of my head. Um, we, I've mentioned it uh, many times, we're an accredited agency through New York State. 
So all of our policies um, follow certain standards that are required by the state. And part of, of continuing to be accredited is to um, reevaluate your policies on a continual basis. So we do that. And um, a lot of times we might, we'll have to tweak them to bring them up to date. Um, if, if one hasn't been visited in three or four years, uh, there could be you know name changes or acronym changes or something that changes. And so we would update it that way. Um, but generally, uh, we don't come up with any um, new policies. I can't say that that doesn't ever happen. Um, but when you're accredited, you're, you're pretty much covering every base that you need to. All right. Well, that leads me. All right. Between you and the mayor, is there anything that you guys in the near to medium term are looking to change that you really don't need any kind of council approval that you can just kind of do on your own? Are you looking at any kind of policy change? I'm not looking at anything right now. Um, I'm looking for suggestions based on the mandate that the governor put out um, for all police agencies, assuming that we all have somewhere that we can improve. Uh, improve. Um, I think the Portland Police Department's in, in very good shape, um, but I'm not um, stubborn enough to not, not want to listen to anything else that somebody might suggest. Um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm not just kind of like, what's your opinion? What do you what do you think that something that that, that could be changed that that you can kind of do on your own without too much input? Is there anything you have? No, I don't. I don't have anything on the top of my head. I mean, we do that all the time anyway. If something needs to be changed, we change it. We don't look for <laughs> we don't look for another authority figure to to drive policy in the police department, unless we're um, looking for some kind of a legal interpretation is all. Okay. And then I guess the last one would be uh, for you and the mayor is like, is there any policy out there that may not, that, that, that either one of you think that that's a good long-term policy that the P should adopt, that the city should adopt that, you know, really hadn't discussed. Does it, I mean, what do you, What's your opinion of a good policy, good policy that should be adopted that we really have really had talked about? Is that a question for me? For both of you, actually, you and the mayor. Um, I, I don't have anything to add to that. I, I, like I said a little while ago, I think the Portland Police Department is in very good shape um, and doing everything that we should be doing. All right. And so there's nothing. All right. Yeah. I, I'm just trying to like get your opinion of what you think you might want to do all, all I want to do is is to be uh, responsive to the residents of the city of Portland if right. there is something else they would like to see changed on how we do it this is where we listen in and we can evaluate as to whether or not it, it, it can be a change that should be made Okay. I don't know if I'm answering your question or not. No, I'm, I'm just, it's honestly an opinion question. Like, I mean, you're, you're grown man. You, you, you know, you kind of see what's out there and you, you've heard different policies, different opinions, the way things should be done. Is there anything that you've heard that you kind of like, but you don't know if the, the city council will go for it or the mayor will go for it or anything like that. And it's kind of the same for the mayor. Has he heard anything that he kind of likes? that he's not sure if the public will go for it or he will go for it, that uh, the city council will go for it. It's just an opinion question, that's all it is. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, as my tenure is cheap, uh, a lot of good ideas came up and a lot of changes uh, we put forth and the city council and the mayor did go for it. Uh, the <clears throat> canine program, we have the community-oriented policing officer, the only one in the county uh, that were dedicated to community-oriented policing. Uh, so yeah, different ideas like that come up and, and we push them forth and I can't say that, you know, the common council gives me everything, but they, they listen and uh, it's been pretty good. Uh, you know, right now, uh, video cameras, we could use more video cameras in different um, areas, but you know, again, it's a budgetary issue. So Brad, just a little bit of a historical perspective. Chief and I, we sat down, there was a request from a community member and we met with, I think it was four different individuals. Um, Chief, I don't know if you remember, but we're over at diner and they expressed some concerns and I was uh, learning at the time and 
I think, well, life is a learning process, but uh, being newly elected to mayor, learning quite a bit about what different departments do and responsibilities. Uh, one of the things that came out of that conversation was making the opportunity for people to file complaints. If they had an issue and they weren't happy with how they were treated, uh, she's made it easier for, pe for people to file a complaint and then have their voice heard. Uh, there were some explanations, there were some questions that were raised at that meeting about policy procedure, and I thought Chief did an excellent job of laying out, here's why we do what we do. Um, and at the end of the meeting, I'm not sure if uh, the four individuals we met with, if everybody walked away satisfied, but I walked away with a uh, deeper understanding and also was gratified to see that there were some things that Chief heard and said, yeah, we can do that and make it more responsive to the community. And I view these forums as essentially being an extension of that. So you asked a specific question, are there things that uh, potentially could be changed? Um, I can't put my thumb on the scale, so to speak, because the um, whatever comes forward in terms of a rough draft will be in collaboration with the chief, the deputy chief, uh, one of the council members, the four of us who've been working on this specifically and also working with community members. And uh, I think it's important that it is a collaborative process. So I would say that, yes, yeah, safe to think that there will potentially be some changes, but, uh, well, recommendations. And then those recommendations would come forward and then we'll hear public feedback about potential recommendations in January. And it remains to be seen from uh, the eight people on council if they would like to see some changes that are recommended or if they uh, are comfortable with how things are structured. But I do see this as being a valuable exercise. It gives us the opportunity to communicate. Part of that is just listening. There was a hand up, but I think it went back down. Oh, Whitney. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Uh, so I want to propose to have more diversity in the um, Cortland City Police Department. And I wanted to know how I, as a um, Cortland citizen, uh, could help bring that forth. Um, and then I just would want to follow that up with um, actually kind of wanting to know, uh, you know, are the majority of the police officers in the department white? Are they, are they more, are there a majority of them male? Like I haven't really had a lot of interactions with the uh, Portland City Police Department, but um, I guess that's what I'd like to know. Um, and how can I help the department become more diverse as in non-white, um, women, uh, transgender, uh, stuff like that. So that was talked about a little bit in the first forum um, as, as far as um, hiring and diversity. Um, we are governed by civil service rules and I alluded to that a little bit um, today too. We, we have to go by civil service laws and guidelines. We're provided with a list of candidates and certain ranking order and that is all that we can consider when it comes to hiring. So if there is no diversity on the list, then there's no diversity for us to pick from. Um, we try to recruit a little bit better to try to get more diverse uh, groups to take the test. And that's where it begins. You've got to be able to be on the eligible list to be looked at. Um, our department right now consists of 44 sworn officers, all uh, white males, other than four white females. So four white females and 40 uh, males, all white. And so you do, since you've looked into it, you do agree that it would be, it would be a benefit you to have more diversity in your department. Absolutely. We would definitely like to have more diversity in our department. Thank you. Right, uh, Mr. Williams. 
Uh, good evening. My name is Steve Williams, and I am a shareholder of Cortland City. Um, so I've listened to a few things that everyone has said tonight, and I just kind of want to help address some of those things. Um, as far as the diversity goes in the department, um, and I, I, if, if you're already not aware, a part of that comes from creating um, a culture that people of color and people of different differing uh, sexual orientation and identities feel comfortable being a part of. Um, you know, the culture itself has to be conducive for people who are not, you know, white men and women. Um, so that starts from the inside. So for the citizen who said, what could she do? It's not, it, it starts from the inside. The department themselves have to create a culture that makes people of color think it's safe to be a part of this. And we want to be a part of this here. Um, there are a few questions thrown out tonight about what reforming the department may look like. Um, I know that there's some different narratives going around from social media or Google. I've heard some people say, you know, they're not really, they're not really well versed in police policy and that, uh, kind of trying to address some police policy. So I just want to kind of clear some things up when people talk about reforming the police or sometimes you hear people say defunding the police, what they're really saying is there are issues that police are being tasked with dealing with and handling that shouldn't be police issues. And because there are, they're being made police issues, there are things in our system that are being criminalized because they're being handled by police officers when they should be handled by psychiatrists, doctors, counselors, um, other social service agencies, and things of that nature. Um, the idea of, of what does a reformed police department look like also stems from the idea of reallocating funds. I heard someone say earlier that, you know, you can't basically, as they said, you can't treat Cortland PD like Milwaukee PD. And while that's absolutely true, there's some semblance of that's, that's what's been happening in a lot of these um, communities of typically disenfranchised people groups, whether that means, you know, by race or by gender or by identity, where, you know, people have been treated one way in one place because of the actions of another group in some other place. Um, and, then there's, and then there's the idea of, of solidarity. There, there's something that a group of people who aren't historically disenfranchised won't be able to understand just how important it is to stand together. And so while the crimes that may be occurring in other police departments, I'm from New York City, for example, and there are very different crimes and events, and even how you define crime, first of all, needs to be redone. But that's a different conversation. But I understand what you know what it looks like to say, hey, this is what policing looks like in Cortland, and policing looks like in, in New York City or in, in L.A. or what have you. But there are some things that a police department, no matter where you're located, um, there are some things that should kind of be a part of the culture. I keep hearing the word diversity be thrown around, for example, and I'm going to keep saying this. Diversity doesn't mean anti-racist. And, and for the person who was on earlier, um, you have to begin to understand that the police department itself, I'm going to continue to say this, was literally built and founded upon certain principles that aren't okay in the culture that we live in today, and they shouldn't be okay. It is okay to revisit some of these institutions that were designed before you know, our, our lives began um, because they need to be updated. Our, our, our population, the population of Cortland, I'm sure it's very different now than it was 100 years ago. I'm sure the population is different now than it was 20 years ago. And so we have to be open as a city to constantly looking at legislation and looking at institutions and seeing how our people are evolving and changing and, and meeting those needs. So it's not just the police department, but the school system, the medical system, you know, businesses as a whole. As a, as a city, we need to really be reevaluating the who, what, where, when, why, and how is what we're doing. Um, so I just want to kind of put that out there. And then the second thing is, I'm hearing people speak about this year in a way that's kind of skirting <clears throat> Pardon me. That's kind of skirting some of the issues that we've been trying to address this year by saying, you know, before this all happened, because it's unclear what this all means. Whether you're talking about COVID, or you're talking about the fact that people of color are standing up and speaking out against 
you know, municipalities and institutions that have typically been disenfranchising to them. Um, there's no better time than now to start to say, like, what's going on? And just because something isn't a problem for you, it doesn't mean it's not a problem for anyone else. Just because something isn't, you know, Corley can be a leader here by being way more progressive than it is. Um, but it starts from in internally, and it starts from the city, the department, uh, the citizens recognizing that these changes need to happen so that other constituents who have an equal say in the communities feel safe in these communities. It's hard, you know, I'm a, I'm a man, for example, and I never have to think twice about, you know, walking somewhere at night. And it's a privilege I enjoy as a male that, you know, some of my female counterparts may not enjoy. It's the same thing for race relations. There, you know, there's certain privileges that we have that, that are race associated that other people don't get to have. So I'm going to challenge everyone on the call today also to really try and understand it's not necessarily about you, but about someone else who, who still doesn't feel the same level of security, safety, and privilege that some of you and us may feel. We got to keep that in the forefront of our mind. Um, and that's really it for now. There's a lot that was said. Um, I do think that maybe, Mr. Mayor, if there is an appropriate time and place to kind of we keep we, we talking about deliberate conversations, if there is if there is a forum that can be developed so these questions can be addressed head on without being uh, distracting from the overall mission. Because it sounds like some of our community members have some questions, have some comments, have some concerns, have some compliments as well. And I think these things need to be fished out with the right way. So, um, if anybody wants to talk to me after this, I'm not hard to get a hold of. Um, let me know. I can give you my contact information, and I would love to continue some of these conversations uh, because, I, you know, I'm going to take your conversation as an interest in learning and growing, and I'm here for it, and we can work on this together. So, uh, that's my piece. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Whitney. Ah. Uh just want to say, I hear you, Steve. Connect with me after this call and we, we can talk about it some more. I don't want to take this forum right here, but I'm interested that Brad as well. Brad, please get a hold of me so we can get on the same page, bro. I would love to have a conversation with you about our city. Hey, Mayor, I have a question for you. Go ahead. Can a straight white man effectively police the city of Cortland? Sorry, repeat the question. Can a straight white man effectively police the city of Cortland or not? It's a very specific question. What does that have to do with anything? <laughs> what does that have to do? What we're looking for, we're looking for immutable, immutable features of people to see whether or not they're, they can effectively police. And so the question simply is, can straight white male effectively police the city of Cortland? Of course. By, 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 because that's a different question for their policing. Yeah. And I, believe, I believe the question was directed to me. My bad. Thank you. Um, Brad, yes. Sure. Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Yes. No, it, it just, the, the, it, I understand the issues. What I'm, what I'm speaking of is when, we're, when you're, when I hear the word reforms and reimagining, it, it's always, it's never specific. What specific are we looking for? When, when somebody asks, oh, well, do we need a transgender person on the police, police force? Okay. We're talking about policing. We're not talking about social work. We're not talking about these different things. We're talking about specifically policing. Do you, does the police department have effective police or not? And can, and if you hire a, you know, it, when, when it comes to hiring practices, is this something you even look at as far as like, you know, if what, what their color is, if, if they're black or not. I mean, it, it's just like it, we're, we're policing. We're not, you know, we're not doing the other things. We're, 
You see what I'm saying? And so when, when you're looking, you're looking for, you're looking for characteristics of people, outward characteristics of people, whether or not they're a good person, which is ridiculous. It, whether or not they're effective police or not, that, that's absolutely ridiculous. So do you have an effective police department or not in the city of Portland? All right, we are, uh, I, I would like to give an answer to this, but. Uh, Let me do it. Steve, I, I apologize, but I'm gonna say no, that this question was directed to me and I'm more than happy to address it because um, I, I think, I don't know, I think I understand where it may be coming from. So uh, the, the original question was, can a straight white male police effectively? Yes. And you can change any of those three words, and the answer would still be yes. Yes, I agree. I, I think it's also important to recognize, though, that law enforcement is an institution, and it's not just in the city of Cortland. It's at the county level. It's at the state level. It's throughout the country in various municipalities. And every department is going to have some things in common and then there will be some things that are different. You know, when our officers go to training, they go to training before they are hired um, to work on the street. They're hired, they go to training, it's at an academy, they have other people that are teaching them. And then they come in and they're working here in the city of Portland. And in the city, our department, they spend chief six months, uh, the first six months being employed, partnering with a training officer who's basically showing them the ropes here. But they didn't start their training when they got here. They didn't start who they were when they went to the police academy or people. So we have a uniform, but it's important to recognize that there is a person behind the uniform. And we have expectations of officers the same way that we have expectations of firefighters and the same way that we have expectations of public works employees. And for law enforcement, it becomes a little bit more uh pointed because there, there's real issues that our officers deal with on a regular basis that are life-threatening not just because of an accident or because of other things but also potentially to you or to i or to them so there's a lot of pressure that can come about in this situation and we need to make sure that we are um, first of all giving our officers the resources that they need to be successful and also holding our officers accountable into a high standard. And part of that is law enforcement as an institution. And that's what we're talking about here. You know, we're talking about policy. We're talking about procedure. We're talking about leadership, equipment. Uh, we talk about what are the general functions that we expect law enforcement to engage in. And then when we talk about the people, um, it's okay to recognize that sometimes people make mistakes. I, as mayor, will make mistakes. A firefighter will make mistakes. A public works employee will make mistakes. And a law enforcement officer at times will make mistakes. But we want everybody to know that there are high expectations because the public trust and the value that we put into the institution is based upon the people. And we need to reinforce that. We need to make sure that the people wearing the uniforms understand that as well. We also need as elected officials to make sure that we hold the public's trust. And by doing these forums, you know, I've heard some things that I hadn't heard before and it's been enlightening, it's been helpful. And as we continue to go forward, we wanna make sure that we are answering these questions. So back to the point of perspective, so you ask, can you know, a uh, straight white male to be a law enforcement officer? Yes. But will that person understand other pers others' perspectives? And will that person be able to relate to the individual who has had a domestic violence issue uh, and is suffering from trauma, or somebody who has past history, or they've had other issues? So the training is absolutely critical and also having a diverse workforce is helpful as well because the dynamic between people as they work with one another, as we've learned from each other, 
So the same way that an officer, when they're hired as a training officer, that takes them through the first couple of months of their their job. Hey, if I'm if as a single, no, I'm married. As a white male, as a straight white male, if I'm only surrounded by straight white males, I'm not getting other perspectives. But if I have other people around me, in terms of my job as mayor, and it might mean the eight people on council, it's listening to the other people in the community. If I have married people, single people, if I've got straight people, if I've got bisexual, it doesn't matter orientation, if I've got white people, people of color, people identify in different ways. When I listen to them, I understand better. And that's part of it is making sure that when we talk about how it works for it. Just one other thing, is like, whenever they talk about, whenever they talk about the recruiting, everybody, whenever they talk about recruiting and hiring, I mean, unfortunately, let's say unfortunately, or and just as it is, Portland is not, you know, 40% black. It's what, 95% white? I mean, 90% 90 94, three or four. Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, you just, you're not going to get a lot of diversity in the in the hiring. I mean, that's just, I mean, that's just kind of self evidence right? No, not at all. And that's a part of, that's why you're not getting evidence in the, commu- in the community. It's, number one, that number's growing. Every year, that number is, in, the number of minority population people are is constantly growing every year. And Steve, I, I would say that the number of the people is not the critical issue here. It's being able to relate. It's understanding that people do come from different backgrounds. And um, the same way that 70 years ago, when there were a lot of Italians that came over and came to Cortland and were not necessarily treated well when they got here, uh, that was a mistake. That was a mistake in our communities. But, you know, we recognize and we learn from these things and we say, how do we do better in terms of being a community, in terms of neighbors knowing neighbors and getting to know one another? And just because there may not be a lot of people who uh, have a different sexual orientation or who have a different color of skin doesn't mean that we shouldn't work for everybody in our community. No, I'm talking about strictly hiring practices. I'm not talking about, I mean, I mean you're just, you're, there's only so many people who take a test and then w- what's the breakdown of that percentage is like women. What, how many, of, I think they said 40 took the test last time. What, five, 10 were women? I mean, so you're just not, you're not going to get a 20% women. You're not going to get, and so you see what I'm saying? It's like, you're, 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 and you're not going to get half the characteristics are not going to be, I don't just, just aren't going to be there when it comes hiring time. Yeah. But here, here's one of the things, and this, this is where, um, I think law enforcement, we, we need to value law enforcement. We need to have, and when I say we mean all of us, we need to have a high level of regard, high level of respect, um, be, because it's dealing with difficult situations and it's putting the public trust that we have people who are going to protect us all. And for us to attract high quality people, for us to attract people that are going to be able to perform under stressful situations, uh, we need to say that this is not only an important job, but it's a respected job. So one of the concerns that I have is when the chief talks about the latest civil service exam, there's 40 people that took it. It was what, 70 or 120 in the past so as the candidate pool gets smaller, we have to ask the question, why is the candidate pool getting small? And how do we keep the candidate pool? Because my impression is that as the candidate pool gets smaller, probably it's not as deep either. So you're not getting the same quality of applicants. And it is a physical job, it's a mental job, and it is an emotional job. So it's not just having the physical skills. You have to also have the mental decision-making abilities, and you have to have a fair amount of emotional capacity because, man, they deal with some stuff. So the more that we can uh, build public trust in what we do, and the more that we can make sure that we are uh, having a cutting-edge police force that is doing what they, not just what they're hired to do, but going above and beyond, then the more people will want to be in law enforcement, and the more we know that we will have the best quality candidates top to bottom. And again, I think we have a very professional and outstanding force currently, and we want to maintain that. So we might need to do some things differently over these next couple of months, maybe the next couple of years, 
to make sure that we continue to recruit strong people that are going to be there and be capable physically, mentally, and emotionally. And that's going to change. That's going to force us to kind of change how we've done things. We're probably going to need to recruit a little bit more. We haven't really done that. And maybe it's just making sure people are aware. Well, how do you apply to be a police officer? What's, what's a civil service mean? You know, what is on that test? There's a fitness test. Well, what's part of the fitness test? Do I just show up and do I think I'm going to pass? Or what should I be doing beforehand to get ready? Because some of these things can be taught. They can be trained. Was too much talking for me during a listening session, but I'm um, sorry, Brad. Hopefully, that answered the question. It, it does. It just, it, I, 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 I hear you and I hear everybody else. It's just when, when it, it's just some of the issues brought up. I'm like, I don't know. I gotta, I just have questions about, and I don't know if this is the place to do it. So, but other than that, Okay. Maybe I'll see you next time. We'll be here on Thursday, and I'm always open for a conversation. And uh, Mr. Williams, I don't know, you said something about uh, being open for conversations. Can you access the chat for everybody, or is it just me? It's just you. The chat's locked. How do I change that? It's a set. And. <laughs> I said it that way. I just don't know how to unsaid it. Wait, wait. Here we go. Everyone publicly. There we go. So, Steve, you had said that you were willing to. So, if you want to put your information in there, um, and if anybody does want to talk, I think these are the conversations. Uh, Steve alluded to something called deliberative dialogues. And this is something that I'm very interested in doing in the community. Deliberative dialogues are bringing together people who have differing viewpoints. I won't even say opposing. Let's just say differing viewpoints. And you start off talking about things that you might have in common or things that you may agree upon and then work on getting a better understanding or appreciation of where other people come. Uh, I've been working with John Suarez from SUNY Cortland on this and we're hoping to do some small group discussions in 2021. Uh, so I'm going to step back from law enforcement entirely on this statement, because I'll say that over the last, not even weeks or months, but I think most people would say over the last couple of years that communities are becoming more polarized. And um, we're having, I think, a harder time having dialogues where we're having discussions with one another. And part of that is listening to one another and getting a better appreciation where people come from. So my hope is that here in the city of Cortland, we can potentially have some conversations with people, get to know their neighbors and have a better understanding and appreciation where they come from. And it may not change minds or change viewpoints, but if we understand one another, I think we can appreciate one another and maybe accept some of our differences a little more easily. It is 636. Is there anybody present that would like to speak before I close out the forum? Very none. Seeing none. I'd like to thank everybody for your presence today. Uh, Steve put his contact information in the chat and um, I'll do the same with my email. If this topic or any of the topics that we discuss, as we get away from law enforcement in particular, there's other things that you would like to discuss. My door is open. And if it is related to law enforcement, my door is open. And the uh, uh, third and final form will be this Thursday. And our goal it is simply to make sure that we are providing the best resources to the city of Cortland that we can provide. Can I say something really quick? Steve, go ahead. All right. It may not be popular, but I think it needs to be said. If this forum is supposed to be a listening session, 
then I want to encourage the, I felt like I had something I wanted to say and I was told I can't say it because we're already off topic. And then we continue to have the off topic conversation. I feel like if we're going to do this again Thursday and it's just a specific like focus you're supposed to have, we got to have it because when we get off topic, it makes other people want to chime in. And then we get told we can't chime into that topic, but then the off topicness continues. It just kind of feels like a disadvantage rabbit hole. So I understand why and where. That's why I'm pushing for these deliberate conversations because I know that there's a different time and place for it. But I want to just encourage everyone who, who is moderating this meeting. If we got to be on topic, that got to be for everybody and the whole time. Otherwise, it feels like we're picking and choosing. And that kind of feels like kind of what we're talking about here is voices being heard and feeling valued. So, but I appreciate it. I know that, you know, I got, I got, you know, I know how to get in touch with you and everybody else. So thank you for letting me say my piece today. I'll see you guys Thursday for sure. No disrespect meant. I hope uh, we've, we, we've strayed a little bit from the main topic, both in the first forum and this forum, but um, you know, in the interest of trying to answer some questions. So we'll continue to try to make sure that we stay on point, but we don't want people leaving feeling like the voices were not heard. Thank you for your time on a uh, cool and drizzly Monday evening. Everybody have a good night. Good night. Stay safe. Thank you for participating.